rabbinic colleagues, distinguished among whom is Rabbi Itamar Rosenzweig, with whom I'm thrilled to share the podium as we pay tribute not only to our respective grandfathers, but the two men whom, as I understand, were college roommates once upon a time. <laughs> I confess to some cognitive dissonance in paying simultaneous tribute to both my grandfather and to our yeshiva. After all, while my grandfather and this institution are inextricably bound, in many ways, he represents its opposite. It's, or at least it's, star counterpart. Our yeshiva is the institutional personification of Lithuania, with all of the cerebral academic precision of that tradition. While my grandfather represents the heritage of Galicia, with its witty, whimsical creativity. Our yeshiva taught us the majesty of Tzvedinim, two concepts underlying a rabbinic dispute. While my grandfather always marveled at the possibility of Shivim Panim, of 70 faces of Torah. The foundation of our curriculum in yeshiva is the Gemara and Rishonim, the raw materials out of which Torah and Halacha are shaped. <clears throat> Whereas, when I would study with my grandfather, we always studied Chumos, responsive literature. The culmination, the literary culmination, the apex of the halakhic process. So is there not then some unresolvable tension at the heart of this evening? I propose that a resolution emerges from the very first tshuva that my grandfather and I ever studied together. A tshuva authored by his grandfather, Rabbi Yoshua Baumel Zatzal, the Emek Halacha. In the tshuva, the Emek Halacha wondered how the Gemara could describe Rabbi Ishmael upon transgressing on Shabbos and thereby making himself liable to a Korban Chatas, how he could write in his ledger that upon the Temple's rebuilding, he would bring a new, a fresh Korban Chatas. After all, the Gemara in Menachos asserts, does it not, that one who recites the Parsha Sachatas, the Psukim describing the Karban Chatas, thereby posits a, a sufficient substitute for the Karban. So why would Rabbi Ishmael feel himself obligated to bring a new Karban Chatas in the Messianic age? Surely he said Karbanas every morning. The Emek Allah ultimately answers by reference to the principle of Kohanim Ochlin, Bailem is But a chatas, even if formally valid, does not achieve atonement for its bearers if the Kohanim have not eaten of the meat of the chatas. Simply reciting the Parsha Sachatas, Rabbi Balmal argued, is equivalent solely to the act of bringing the carbon itself. But Rabbi Ishmael, knowing that he could not give meat to anybody, could not provide sustenance to any actual Kohanim, thereby asserted that when the opportunity would present itself in the age of the Third Temple, he would bring a new karma, and thereby sustain the Kohanim of his day. <coughs> it seems then that there are two ways of conceiving of the Karban Chatas or at least of the recitation of the Parsha Sachatas. First, reciting the Parsha Sachatas is an abstract conceptual act. Is this Parsha Sachatas is a sufficient substitute for the Karban Chatas? Has the Karban Chatas been brought or not? And this question, as you will know, takes no regard for who brings the Karban Chatas, who says the Karban Chatas, whether a Kohen has eaten from the Karban, from the Karban Chatas, this analysis treats all human beings equal. But in addition, the recitation of the Parsha Sachatas is a particular act with human consequences. Perhaps there is a Kohen who, in the era of the Beis Amikdash, might have eaten from Yorok Rabban Chatas, but in the absence of such, may go hungry today. He may have nothing to eat. 
while we may formally discharge our obligation to bring the Korban Chatas by reciting the Parsha Sachatas, it is incumbent upon us that we realize that our actions in so doing dramatically impact a living, breathing human being, the Kohen. And therein lies the answer. Therein, I believe, lies not just the coherence, but the necessity of honoring both our yeshiva and not just my grandfather, but all of our grandfathers and all of our families. That is, for Torah to thrive, for our religion to become not just a dull habit, but an acute fever within us. We require both our yeshiva and our grandparents. Our yeshiva is required to equalize all of us. Our yeshiva teaches us that no matter who we are, no matter where we come from, we all learn the same Rambam, the same Melchamos, the same Kitzos. And in teaching us this, our yeshiva transforms us from individuals into a unified collective, into Klali Yisrael, writ large. Our yeshiva is the act, the essential act of bringing the karma. We are all equal. But our grandparents, and in my life, my grandfather especially, always remind us of the reverse. They remind us of the human element in Torah. They remind us of the beautiful, unique individuals whose contribution shaped each of our personal journeys through the peaks and valley of halacha. They remind us of the souls whose lives become transformed by the Torah that we might teach from this day forward. They remind us that Torah ultimately has not just metaphysical consequences, but also world historical consequences, human consequences. And so my tefillah this evening is that as I and my colleagues sally forth into Avodah, into Avodah Sakodesh, that we may bring pride and nachas not just to our yeshiva, but to you, Zayda, as well. Mazel tov, many thanks for this evening. Thank you.